All right, we're going to talk about management of end-of-life issues in the ED. Um, how many of you, and if you're willing to share, have had to deal with end-of-life issues in a loved one? It, to me, totally changed my perspective on this, to have personally lived through this with a loved one. Um, the, the Brittany Maynard story that made the news recently where the 29-year-old woman with brain cancer moved to Oregon so that she could end her life with dignity on her terms has raised a lot of this discussion. Um, and I think it's a crucially, crucially important discussion. And we in emergency medicine have sort of dodged this for a really long time because I'm just the emergency practitioner. It's not my role, it's, it's the oncologist's role, it's the pulmonologist's role, it's somebody else's role to deal with this. And what I think we're learning as a medical community is that as practitioners, it is all of our job to deal, not just with end of life issues, but choices, that people have choices. It's a very good segue from what Jerry just talked about to this, is that people have a lot of choices in their healthcare and they have a lot of choices on how their lives end. Because the reality is from the minute we're born, we're dying. Some of us just know more about it, more details about it as we go through. Sometimes it's you walk out and get hit by a car, you don't know today's the day. And sometimes it's diagnosed with a cancer that turns out to be something that you can't survive and then you know sort of more of your path. This is just part of the deal. So part of, all of these have to do with decisions and thoughts. And we'll talk about also sort of the process of dying because it helps to understand that. And it's not as much of a downer as it sounds like. Um, I think that part of medicine is that we get in this mindset of curing disease, diagnosing disease. It's this battle of you know, conquering things instead of just accepting the fact that part of the process of living is the process of dying. And we can have a huge impact on how that's interpreted. There's a book I highly recommend if you haven't read it yet called Being Mortal by Atul Gawande. He wrote Better, he wrote The Checklist Manifesto, he's a neurosurgeon in Boston, he's a remark he's well published, he's published, I think it's probably six or seven books now, he writes an article in the New Yorker magazine. He's really, really wonderful, he's a great author, and he writes an incredibly personal book about dealing with his father, who was a urologist, his father's diagnosis with what turned out to be ultimately a terminal disease. And he deals with the shared decision-making that didn't occur early in his father's care. And he deals with the process as a physician of dealing with a, health, a, a life-threatening health issue in a family member. It was, and, he, and he starts the book with, I think, a very interesting history, which is until about 50 years ago, 40 years ago, when you were diagnosed with something that was terminal, you had, and this is in the pre-antibiotic era, it was even more so, you went home. Your family took care of you, they brought you chicken soup, they tucked you in, they kept you warm, they were with you when you died, they laid you out on the kitchen table, they prepared your body. This was part, dying was part of life. And now we've taken it and sterilized it and, and put it over in the niche of a hospital and made expectations as a culture that that's what happens. If you go to another country, if you go out of North America, you go to a developing country, going to the hospital means you go to die. That it, it's, and it's a cultural thing that gets brought to, with immigrants to this country. Coming to the hospital is scary for people, as it should be. And we've made it so that now that's where people die. They die in the hospital. Fortunately, there's enough of a backlash now with people understanding that that isn't necessarily the best place to die and that they have some choices in what they, what they have done, what their treatments are, et cetera, that has just been a huge sea change recently. And God bless the palliative care society and push in this country for helping people learn that they have some choices. So it goes back to shared decision-making as well, which is all but we'll talk about a part of this. So the key to all of this is what's called goals of care. And thank goodness medical schools are now starting to teach this. So we have graduates now coming out of medical school that understand the concept of what are the goals of your care. And it, has, it isn't even necessarily end of life. It's just what are the goals in your cancer therapy? What are the goals of care with your chest pain? Do what, you know, is it more important to you to be here in the hospital so in case something happens we're here? Or is it more important for you to be home? These are goals of care. And it becomes critically important when someone has a potentially life-threatening or terminal illness. It means that, that you approach the concept of what do you want, rather than here's what I'm going to do. Here's what the system is going to, there's the test you're going to get. Here's the, when my father was diagnosed with lung cancer, not once, not once in his 10 months of life after his diagnosis did his oncologist ever ask my father what he wanted. 
Not once. It went from chemo number one to chemo number two to chemo number three to chemo number four. And his hair fell out and he threw up and all that lovely stuff that goes with chemo. Not once did he get asked, what is it you want? He was never given the choice. So part of us as a medical community is to offer that concept. What is it you care about? Because we'll get into this. There's some ways of addressing this that take the sort of the pressure off of, you know, the doing everything concept. It totally changes the, the sort of playing field on this. But the idea of goals of care, what is it you want here, is really, really important. So goals of care, that concept, be, should become, become integral into your patient interactions, especially when it comes to the patient who may be dying. Sort of end of life care becomes particularly important. Now, let's get into some medical parts of this. What does dying look like? We've all seen it, right? We've all seen it. People that have family members dying at home haven't seen this. This is no longer part of society. They haven't seen this. So there is a normal process to end of life as, as things just start to fade. Um, there are a couple of papers that actually look in this, look at this. And the reason it's important for us to kind of get our heads around it is that we can then help guide family members as far as what to expect with end of life care. So for instance, the natural history of dying is to lose your appetite. You're not hungry. You just don't want to eat anymore. Okay, that's part of the natural process of dying. You get a dry mouth. That's part of the natural process of dying. Weakness, some confusion, constipation. Everything's just shutting down. Okay? Everything just sort of starts to shut down. And all of that happens usually over about the last week of life. As that happens, it's helpful for instructing family members. This is the normal process of dying. You know, your grandmother isn't hungry right now. She just doesn't want to eat, and that's okay. She's not miserable. It's not hurting her. She just doesn't want to eat. This is part of what happens as, as, as you know, the end of life approaches. So the family members focus more on being with their loved one and caring about their loved one than on sort of an artificial marker. Oh, they must, I've got to feed them. Oh, my poor father, we threw everything. He, my poor dad, within 12 hours before he died, he ate half a pastrami sandwich because I damn near shoved it down his throat because I really thought he really, he needed to eat something. That's, it just, they don't have an appetite. That's okay. And it gives you an idea of, especially in a, in a terminal cancer patient in particular, some idea of sort of what to tell the family. You know, we're, it's, yeah, we're getting kind of, it's within a week or so, we're getting kind of close here. And if the patient has the death rattle, you've heard it, okay, you know what it is. I heard my father transition right into the death rattle. That's about 24 hours. Somebody gets to that point, it's about 24 hours. What you tell a family is we're dealing with hours to days here. Okay, we're getting down to hours to days. So this, this is part of the change of the dying process. It's kind of helpful just in prognosticating and giving families a time frame to kind of get their head around. That we've all seen it. This just kind of codifies it. And there are a couple of papers in here that look at this. By the way, most of the papers in this section are on cancer patients. They're not on um, sort of end stage heart disease patients or COPD patients, although, or elderly patients who have just, it's, they're older and it's time. I have an elderly grand aunt right now that's going through this. This is mainly cancer patients that we're talking about with this particular end of life approach, although it does occur eventually with most people. Now, palliative measures for dyspnea. Our gut reaction when someone comes in short of breath, okay, air hunger, is to grab the oxygen and plug them in. It turns out that the dyspnea that occurs at the end of life, which is part of end of life, there's a dyspnea part of this, that dyspnea does not respond to oxygen therapy. And it is independent, the papers in here say this, it is independent of hypoxia. They can, be nor, they can be, have normal uh, saturations or low sats, and you can get their sats back up even with oxygen. That doesn't take away the dyspnea. It is independent. It's part of the dying process. What will fix it are opiates. Please, please, please grab the opiates. It doesn't have to be a big dose. So it's about a milligram of morphine to start. You titrate that until the dyspnea goes away. You're not snowing them. And in fact, there are papers in here, if you have any concerns about it, or the family have any, has any concerns about it, there are papers in here that show you, and they're all in here so you can see, that it does not increase people's CO2. It does not decrease their O2. It does not snow them. It takes away the air hunger. It takes away that feeling of, I can't breathe. It smooths it over. So please go ahead and grab the oxygen. That's fine, but grab the morphine as well. Okay, grab an opiate and it's not huge doses. It's just enough. And you just titrate it till they're comfortable. And it's not comfortable sleeping out snowed. It's comfortable I'm not 
air hungering anymore. It is remarkably powerful, and it's more powerful than anything else out there that's been tested. Opiates, and opiates work. Benzos don't. That anxiety isn't an anxiety. It's a true air hunger that opiates will ameliorate. Really, really important. So, and, it, and again, you're not accelerating the death process. Or you're just making somebody comfortable who's going through that process themselves. So please grab the opiates. Really, really key. And there's a couple of papers in there to help you feel a little more important about it. If they're short of breath, and they're just mic, is there a role for non-invasive ventilation? It, now, non-invasive ventilation is awesome. And it basically, for CHF patients, for COPD patients, it's first-line therapy. Flat out, no question, first-line therapy. Awesome stuff. Does it have a role here in the end of life? The arguments for it are basically you can make people feel a little better as far as their breathing. And sometimes the process that's making them a little bit sick today, you can get them over and they can either go home sometimes or they can stay alive long enough that they can take care of their own sort of end-of-life paperwork and family issues, or family can come and visit. That's one of the upsides. I use it quite a bit for that because I have a high, our immigrant patient population where I work is a lot of them, and they have family members that are far, sometimes even on other continents that they like to have come as the, you know, while they're dying. So we can keep people alive for a while sometimes with this. The downside, though, is sometimes it's just delaying the inevitable. Okay, it's, this is it, you know, this is the end of life and they are uncomfortable with it sometimes, it's just delaying the inevitable. And you're gonna have to sort of use it on a case by case basis. I think there's a role, you have to use it carefully, the people have to be comfortable having it done, but, but just know that this is something to kind of have in your bag of tricks for end of life care, especially in somebody who doesn't, their business isn't all kind of straightened out. They really have a family member, they wanna be there, et cetera. So you can consider that. How about that death rattle? So, um, is there anything you can do to actually treat the death rattle? It is remarkably disturbing to, for a family member to be around and hear that, that rattling sounds. It, it just, it is very disturbing. And unfortunately, the things that have been studied to treat that death rattle to make it go away don't really work. Um, what you lose is your ability to clear your secretions as well as before, and everything just starts to collect there. Suctioning doesn't particularly help, it just makes you choke. Um, things like atropine, drying agents don't particularly help, they just make it thicker. Um, expectorants don't work particularly well. So part of the death rattle problem is to, as much as you can, get the family members or people that are around them comfortable with the idea that this is a natural part of the process and the other thing that's helpful is the patient is usually not aware at that point. When they've gotten to the point of the death rattle, they are no longer aware. So they're not suffering. It's not causing them any dis discomfort. It's just disturbing to listen to as a loved one. So it's something to, it, as in instructing and talking to the family, is that this is the natural part of dying. Your loved one is not aware of this. They're not at all uncomfortable. Um, they're breathing issues that they were feeling air hunger before, taking care of with the medicines we've given the opiates. It's, it, this is the natural process. And we're now down to kind of hours to days. So let's all gather and be around your loved one. Okay, that sort of gives them a timeline. So there's not a lot you could do to actually help that, except help the family understand that's part of the process. How about hydration? Um, you, get, you, you lose your thirst as you, get, as you get to the dying process. You lose your thirst. Does and family members completely freak out at the idea of a family member being dehydrated. It's, it's a very, it's, it, again, it's something to focus on. Their mouth is so dry. They need to have some liquids. They need to be drinking something. They, they haven't had any water for a day. We need to give some fluids there. Does hydrating somebody who's dying help? Well, it turns out that it doesn't really help and there is some potential for harm, depending on what the reason is somebody is dying. So there's a paper in here that looked at comparing just 100 cc's total for fluid hydration versus a liter over a day to see did there change, was there any change in those individuals as far as their time to death, their comfort level as they were dying, was there any difference? And it turns out there wasn't any significant difference and there was actually some potential harm, particularly in people who had things like heart disease as their end of life problem, as the reason that they were dying. It could exacerbate. In some cancers where fluid collections were worse or liver fa uh, failure patients where their ascites got worse. It just turned out not to be particularly helpful. So if it's truly the end of life process, it's probably not useful. But if the family is very, very tied to that, you can do basically, you say, we'll, we'll give this a go. Absolutely, I, I completely understand your concern. Let's give it a try and let's see what happens here. If anything gets worse, we can always stop. Okay, it's fine to try, but it doesn't usually help and it doesn't usually prolong anything. It doesn't just do much at all. Now, one of the things that came up in, this, in the last hour was how do we talk to people about this? 
How do we talk to people about end-of-life care? How do you talk to a family who says, I want everything done for grandma? How do you deal with those conversations? It turns out there's some really great phrases that you can use that change the playing field completely from we have all this technology that can keep your loved one alive, do you want us to do all this technology? Well, that's a default. We get into our techno speak. We don't talk about the real deal. There's much better ways of approaching this. And it's interesting what people want. So when you start to ask people, what's your, what's your goal today? You know, um, you, you've told me about your cancer. You've told me that the doctors have said that the, you know, the chemo is now done, that there's no more chemo. There's, what, what's your goal today? What would you like? What is, what's, what is, what's most important to you? It is remarkable to me when you phrase it like that, what people will come back with. You know what's really important to me today? I know I'm dying, but my granddaughter graduates from college in three weeks. I really want to be there. That's the most important thing to me. Or March Madness is coming up. I am a Duke fan, and I want to watch that game, damn it. Keep me alive to watch them beat Wisconsin. My husband is a Duke fan. He's been talking about that game all forever since that thing happened. But maybe that's what's most important. Ask them, and what they answer you gives you a framework. Most people don't say, I want everything done. I want you to poke me 12 ways from Sunday. I want to stick a tube down my throat. I want to barf my way till I die. They don't say that. They're not, they don't know that. So now you can talk about it. What's important? I want, to, I want to sit on the couch with the remote control, and that's fine with me. That's all I want. I'm good. I'm good with that. We can face that. You can get them there. Now there's no more, let's, we're going to offer you all these things. It's, it's wonderful. So goals of care, what's important to you? Amazing how it distills down. Older people. So you talk to people, there's a paper in here, you talk to people in their sort of 70s, 80s, and 90s, and you ask them, what's your goal of care in life here? What, what do you want? Most of them say, don't you charge a bazillion dollars that my family's going to inherit by resuscitating me. Don't you go there. Don't you even think about it. And don't you ask them, because they'll say to do it. I'm saying, no, don't do that. Okay, I, I, that is not what I want to have, have happen here. And I want to go out comfortably. I don't want to hurt. Make me comfortable. That's a very reasonable approach, and, that's, and we can totally and completely do that. Without question, we can do that. There, there's wonderful articles in here that sort of talk about how to approach it. Um, the other issue that comes up for us in the ER, and this happens, and unfortunately, it, it, our colleagues aren't as good at addressing this before the crisis moment, right? We're always right there at the crisis moment. You know, the grandma in the nursing home where the discussion has never happened is now is short of breath and comes in and you have to sit at the bedside and decide, do we intubate this person or not? What, what do we want done? That when you go talk to families about this, um, one, instead of saying, do you want us to do everything, which you should never, ever say again for the rest of your career, ever, ever, don't ever say that. Um, especially if you know this is really, truly an end-of-life issue. This is the nursing home person who has pneumonia. They're in severe respiratory distress. They haven't talked to their family members in 10 years. This is just it. What you can do is use a phrase called, I'd like to allow natural death. I would like to allow natural death to occur. What we do here in the hospital is not natural. What we do is a very unnatural thing. Death is a very natural thing. I would like to allow your grandmother to have natural, comfortable death. I and people, they get that. They really understand that. It's like, oh, right, that machine isn't, and then what will we do with the machine? And we have to think about turning it on. Can you make her comfortable? Of course, I can make anybody comfortable in the ER. I absolutely can. The concept of allowing natural death, especially if you're not in the crisis moment, if there's a little bit of time to talk about it ahead of time, you, know, you come in with, we are able to talk. What would you like? I don't want to tube down my throat. I want to be comfortable. Allow natural death. Don't, give, don't get to techno speak. Techno speak actually is a, is a killer for making any sort of progress. So don't say DNR. Basically, it's allow natural death. It's not that I'm not going to resuscitate. It's that I'm going to allow the natural process to happen comfortably for your loved one. It works, it works beautifully, absolutely beautifully. So things like there's nothing more we can do, no. What can I help you? What, what can I help you with today? What's the most important thing to you today? Really key. Um, what were you hoping I could do to help you? These are all phrases that you can actually focus on to, to help sort of get through the hard stuff, these conversations. Do you have any, what do you guys use? Do you have any phrases that you guys use that you like? I found these to be very helpful. You guys must have some, yeah. Oh, okay. So she's from, she's talking about cultures where the family members demand that you not tell the patient 
anything about the fact that things are not going so well. Yeah. What I do is I get a couple family members by the bedside, mm -hmm. and I say, Diane, all your studies are back, and I don't have all the information. When it comes back to what we can tell you or your son, and they say in front of the family members what they want to have happen, and the families either are called or they want the information. Or I don't so this is so actually this Mary Margaret thing is a very important concept. How many of you have this happen where you have a cult? We have a lot of different cultures where I work where the the um, ethnic cultural sort of schema is that there's a point person for the family that makes all the decisions for the family. And often it's the, like the, the first son of grandma. Um, and they, the family says, don't tell grandma that she has cancer or don't, don't, we don't want, tell me, but don't tell grandma, which ethically, I'll tell you, bioethics says that's wrong. Patient autonomy comes number one. However, you have to be sensitive to cultures. So your approach is wonderful where you basically ask the patient if, you know, when I get your medical information back here, do you want to know or do you want me to tell a family member? And if you have the family members at the bedside, that's even better because then if she says, no, I want to know, this family member who says, no, 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 I'm the poor person has to now understand and honor that the patient's decision. These are interesting, actually. These are ethically fascinating um, dilemmas that actually are much easier to solve than you might think by doing something like that or just asking the patient directly. If the patient says, no, I don't want to know any of this, talk to my son, I trust my son, he can make the decisions, that's fine. But then it's out in the open. That's a, a relatively common problem. And I love that solution. All right. How about palliative consults? Do you guys have access to palliative care? How many, high hands high, how many have access to palliative care in your ER? So this is really interesting. We did a palliative care talk in this course three years ago. One hand went up, one. It doesn't surprise me in the slightest that the new specialty of hospice and palliative medicine, they need a new, new term for that. They need, to, they need a new, that sounds, uh. but the, the, that specialty, the vast majority of people going into that are emergency physicians. I now have six colleagues of mine, six, who either do part-time or have switched to full-time palliative care medicine practice. Because we see where the system falls apart, right? We see where it wasn't ever addressed. We're on the crisis, man and we also know that it can be way better than what happens often. So we've gotten involved in this, and these palliative care services are fabulous. We finally have one where I work. It took a long time to get this because county funding is just a big problem, but it's enormously helpful. One of the things about it, yeah, oh, oh go ahead, stay out. No, I was just going to say, one of the things that I've noticed in the last, and you know, I've worked with you for 30 years, in the last, I'd say, five to six years, you, whenever I would ask physicians about it, amongst you know, college and practice, everybody said, oh, it's up to me. I want, you know, so we ourselves are into that. And I think finally what happened is about five or six years ago, this finally started of clicking, hey, let's get the patients into this too. Do we put that what we do for ourselves? Mm -hmm. And then roller balls, like he said, the same thing on how we five years ago, nobody. Now we've got a whole staff and they put, you know, new uh, new staff members, palliative care. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it's just it's not a snowball now. Well, and there's one of the dirty little secrets of medicine, and actually this has been studied, is that medical practitioners, particularly physicians, don't ever die an ugly death for two reasons. One is we don't, we don't, we don't take the care that we know is so harmful. They're not, you're not taking out my lung for a lung cancer that's metastatic that I, it's not going to fix it anyway. You're not doing that. I'm not going to take chemo that's going to extend my life two months of barfing instead of having two months of great and then it's over. We don't, we don't get ourselves into that situation and when the time comes, we know how to make ourselves comfortable and we have access to doing that. So this idea that we share that now with other people, with our patients, is wonderful, and I think that's one of the drives toward palliative care. Patients like it, but we have to be a little careful in the ER. The studies that look at this in the emergency department, um, the, I think you have to be a smidgen careful. I think it's fine to, if someone is open to the idea and kind of understands the concept to start, especially if they initiate the conversation, or you say, what are your goals and who have you talked to about this? If they're into the idea now, it's fine to start it in the ER, but the studies that show that it runs into bumps is when um, the patient's not ready yet. They haven't quite gotten to the discussions. That they're just getting their head around the fact they're sick and that this may be, you know, sort of now there's more, more circumscribed time left to them, where you can initiate it either as a referral later 
or upstairs if they're getting admitted, where it get, becomes part of their whole medical process. It, you have to be a smidgen careful in the ER with this. Um, but just kicking open the door with what are your goals and what, what, what do you hope to have come, come out of this and you know, to whom have you spoken about this stuff, then you can at least get that door kicked open. Palliative medicine is incredibly empowering. It is from people, and the other thing, just so you know about palliative medicine, when they've compared groups of people with the same illnesses, with the same prognoses, and they've compared the group that goes in palliative care and the group that grows into our standard usual medical care, they live longer in the palliative care group longer, not just better, longer. Remarkable data, absolutely, remarkable data, yeah. <laughs> Say it again. Is that to any degree a socioeconomic issue though? How so? Because I work in a couple of groups, um, or actually, but uh, one of them is probably a middle class to upper middle class uh, socioeconomic area, the other, other ones are very lower. Mm -hmm. The palliative stuff? Whereas in the other one, honestly, I'll get a patient in, and within a minute, a family will run in and don't do anything, don't do anything. Right. Please Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know that, right. I'm not sure of the data on, so it makes some sense. I mean, it, I think there's some logic to that. And I mean, for instance, we just, I have a lower class patient population I work with, and we just got our palliative care service a year ago. So we're kind of behind in that. So I think there's probably something to that, but I'm amazed how quickly people get up to speed in understanding all these concepts and, and it's empowering for them. I think it's pretty amazing. So all the data on here, just to take home, understand the death process sort of what happens to people. No, the death rattle we can't treat very well. Hydration may or may not help people. Opiates are absolutely the way to go for somebody who's short of breath at the end of life, without question. Um, Dehydration is part of dying, unfortunately. And keep the discussion patient-centered. As much as possible, keep the discussion patient-centered because it's all about them, okay? It's not about you. It's not about us. It's not about the system. It's all about them.